Namaskar and a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is with immense pleasure that I welcome you all to our 17th Sustainability Summit. We're very happy to share that in order to reduce the footprint, certain initiatives like reduced use of paper, no use of plastic bottles, cotton-based backdrops, hoardings, and signages have been used at the summit. It is indeed an honor and privilege to welcome all of you to the session on partnerships and innovation for India's circular economy transition. I welcome all our distinguished speakers of the session who are here with us today and request you to join us on stage. Some of our speakers will also be joining virtually. I now invite Dr. Nandini Kumar, consultant, CII ITC Center of Excellence for Sustainable Development, to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Kyati. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to all our participants here sitting on the dais. I just want to start on a slightly philosophical note. We have a fairly good idea in terms of sustainability about where we need to be. Certainly, we can visualize something. It's certainly where we are not right now. But the question is, how do we get where we want to be? What steps will hasten progress on this journey, which will not cause unintended consequences, the same unintended consequences that landed us where we are today, and will allow contextualization so as to remain relevant and inclusive? As we struggle to reach the 2030 SDGs and with a huge planetary population, I think environmentalists, companies, everyone is seeking sustainable economic growth that neither increases raw material consumption and dependencies nor damages the environment. Pipe dream maybe, but we have to try. We have to begin somewhere. In 2021, Niti Aayog in India constituted 11 circular economy committees and entrusted line ministries with the task of developing action plans for their respective sectors. This transition is expected to meet the aim of productivity enhancement, opportunities for new businesses and jobs, and will be supported by active public policies covering regulations, extended producer responsibility frameworks, and innovation facilitation. The European Union and its 27 member states are early adopters of circular economy and resource efficiency. We're often told that the Indian system with its 27 or 28 states is similar to that of the European Union, what with a huge diversity in culture and language. The European Union has worked towards helping and encouraging its global partners to do the same in light of national circumstances and capacities. So given the interconnected nature of the global economy, which has come to us so vividly in the last two years with geopolitical changes, with the COVID pandemic, the transition we know is going to require collaborative approaches, public and private partnerships, enabling everyone to move forward. And I think the message of collaboration and cooperation has come forth very, very strongly over the last two years. I'd like to invite Dr. Michael Buki of the European Union. He's a counselor at the European Union delegation to India based in Delhi and leads a section responsible for dialogue and cooperation between the EU and India. Before he joined this delegation, Dr. Buki worked in Jakarta holding similar responsibilities for the EU Indonesia and ASEAN. He holds a PhD and an engineering degree from the French National School for Forest and Water Management. He says that he's a forester, but actually he knows much more about other things than just forestry. Dr. Buki, please. 
Thank, thank you very much, Nandini. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Namaskar. Um, I'm very delighted to be given a, a second opportunity to address uh, the Sustainability Summit. I'm very grateful to uh, CII and to the uh, Center of Excellence for Sustainable Development, as well as to my uh, dear colleagues, uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Rashna Arora uh, in GIZ, who was, was working uh, very closely with us. We just had our uh, steering committee, project steering committee yesterday afternoon, and uh, it's, it's one of the dearest projects uh, to me. Indeed, I'm, I'm not uh, a circularity expert, uh, I'm, I'm more uh, an enthusiast of circular economy. I, I was trained as a forester, but when you, you come to India, you realize the amazing potential that there is to, uh, to grow uh, a circular economy with an Indian flavor, with uh, Indian learnings. And that's what I, I want to, to talk about today. I'm, I'm very glad uh, the, the companies uh, uh, sent a representative uh, to us today, because in the session we had this morning, I was very frustrated uh, that uh, we talk about plastics and how much plastic is too much or enough plastics, but we don't talk enough about all the alternative material products and services uh, that have to replace uh, the, the, the bad parts of the plastic economy. So now we have an opportunity to do so. We were just discussing about uh, uh, crockery that you can eat and, and many products that can be substituted. So that's an occasion to talk about it. More broadly, I'm not here to talk to you about uh, what we do in Europe. Uh, we have an excellent uh, website, and I'm sure you, you can all figure out on Google and uh, the Europa.eu uh, Europa website, uh, everything we do. We, we have a range of, uh, of policies and action plans on the various sectors. But what, what I would like to uh, draw your attention to is what, what is in a partnership, what are the conditions uh, for a partnership to emerge, especially between the EU and Indian uh, private sector. Uh, I'll start by uh, uh, stating the obvious, that we, we live in an interconnected and globalized world. Uh, so we, we know that in order to for India or EU to transition to a circular economy, it cannot just do so by itself. Uh, we need to develop uh, peer learning, investment, technology transfer, and supply chains uh, that are able to connect to, to each other. Uh, we, we therefore need to co-innovate and uh, revisit those solutions that have been developed on one side or the other, so that they also make sense uh, in the other side. It is uh, equally obvious, I believe, that uh, the, any circular economy solution or any uh, sustainability solution for that matter have to make economic sense in order to be lasting. Given the, the diversity and heterogeneity of approaches, uh, we, we need to develop a good matchmaking between uh, the local needs and the capacities and the technologies that is felt appropriate at a given point in the transition. Um, to, to say it more simply, we cannot just transpose one-to-one -one, uh, the, the products, uh, the policies, the standards that we have developed for the European business and consumer in a European context, and that's not our objective. We, of course, uh, would like uh, our businesses to uh, come and grow in India and participate to the Indian transition to circular economy. Some of the, uh, the partners to this very summit uh, have been relatively successful in doing so. This morning, uh, we had uh, Her Excellency Cecilia Ercombe, uh, who's the ambassador for sustainable business uh, from Sweden. And uh, Sweden, if you look at uh, its weight in the EU GDP, is about uh, three or four percent. But in India, 10% uh, of the EU companies that are active and growing in India are Swedish. And one could say, well, they can't afford to be green because they are successful. My message is they are successful because they have managed to become green on time, because they have anticipated uh, changes in the, in the landscape, in the economic landscape. So it's, I think it's, it's an example of success when we can find uh, areas of sustainability that are also a win-win from an economic perspective. And I'm not, by that, I'm not implying that we are just trying to adapt uh, our wisdom to India. I think it goes very much both ways. Uh, India, um, 
driven, forged, I would say, by necessities and, and century of wisdom as, as a flourishing repair economy, for instance. I'm very impressed that things that uh, I would have to discard in Europe, I can go to a narrow place and I can get uh, repaired in a very small shop in a very small corner that is like nearly impossible to find, but yet everything can be fixed in India. And in Europe, we are still struggling to try and reinvent that repair economy. Uh, the same could be said about uh, reverse logistics. It, it's not called reverse logistics in India, maybe, but it has been happening for uh, centuries, probably, and it works very well. Uh, the problem is that it's very hard to track. It doesn't fit into an Excel spreadsheet, uh, but it works. So the question is really how can we uh, extract the value knowledge uh, that is into that and make it work with uh, the, this philosophy of circular economy that we are sharing between you and India? Um, in Europe, uh, we, we've learned that uh, resource and energy efficiency, emphasis on energy at the time, uh, are more than just a scene coat of uh, uh, green paint. Uh, they are really the roaring engine of growth uh, in, in, and continued modernization in design, in production, in distribution and services. That's actually the only way forward. If you look at the EU Green Deal strategy, which is really the core work program of the current uh, European Commission, it is called a strategy for growth. It's a strategy for sustainable growth, but it's a strategy for growth. It's not, it's not an environmental policy. It's, it's what we envisage to be the key of competitiveness. And uh, the same in India, uh, the, the Minister of Finance uh, in her address uh, earlier uh, this year on the, on the national budget, she also emphasized the value of, of circular economy as a condition for jobs and growth. And I, I think it's very true. However, when our uh, VIPs, uh, Her Excellency, the, the President of the Commission, Mrs. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, or when uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Prime Minister Modi discuss, uh, they all want those transfers of technology, those cross investments to happen. Yet eventually, it's in the end of the private sector and the private investors to make it happen. So we can, we can foster a business environment uh, that is conducive, but eventually it has to be like a mutual recognition that there are certain issues that can be uh, addressed by technology upgrades, by mutual peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, but the, the eventual decision to make an investment, to risk a technology and to find a reliable partner on one side or the other is down to the businesses themselves. So the, my point here is that we have been very active with the, the GIZ REI initiative. Uh, we are uh, going through the second phase of the project and, and we are very keen to extend for a third phase at the end of 2023. And we are thinking at what it could look like. And one of the conclusion of that is, is exercise is that it cannot uh, exist uh, as an all encompassing tool. It, it has to be, it can only be uh, just a, a hub or just a node into a network of initiative that needs to be somehow coordinated. And we are, we are very grateful to India, to the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, as well as uh, Niti Ayog for having set up this, uh, this uh, structure of uh, policy guidance, as well as sectoral committees that are trying to foster this improvement uh, in, in the line ministries. It is our intention in the third phase uh, that we would support the, the new thinking in the ministry that seems to be going in the direction of uh, emerging uh, centers of excellence that will drive the conversation further. It's clear that there is a need for training, awareness raising and, and coordination. And we, we stand by India to, to try and encourage those transitions. Um, I want to come back to the issue of adaptation. When I say adaptation, I don't only mean adaptation to climate change. Uh, I mean very concrete uh, second tier technologies, I would say, frugal innovation that could make a difference. I'm talking, for instance, about uh, designing batteries that can resist the daily heat, uh, which at the moment is a bit of a challenge, but at the same time, at the end of their life cycle, can be repurposed, remanufactured, or refurbished, that can be recycled or upcycled. The, the, the amount of work that needs to be done across all sectors uh, is huge. We could also talk about um, digitalized supply chain that uh, merge and, and leverage 
uh, this organized chaos in the in the informal sector I was as I was mentioning earlier um, that that can uh, aggregate all those small hands those uh, home workers or those very small SMEs and make them part of, uh, of an innovative um, uh, landscape of circular economy um, we are talking also about uh, construction material uh, that are uh, substituting for a very emissive sector like steel, cement, and using more and more uh, bio-based uh, materials uh, that have, of course, a much better uh, time at footprint, but that are also uh, easier to uh, recycle and reuse. So um, we are basically waiting for Indian entrepreneurs to uh, reinvent, revent, sorry, re reinvent, revamp, and uh, tailor the, the EU clean technologies, I mean, I'm saying EU, but as I, I'm sure it's equally true of, of Japan and the US. We do, however, have, I think, an edge uh, on, on circular economy because uh, it has been um, a driver of the environmental agenda uh, for years before it became a driver of the business agenda. Um, the way we do it in India is, of course, through policy dialogue, but also more and more through pilot initiatives that we would like to scale up in uh, certain sectors, like uh, the recycling of uh, fishing nets, uh, the, use, the utilization of crop residues, uh, uh, circular ceramic, uh, or the, the eco-design and manufacturing of car parts. Eventually, we would like to go as far as uh, supporting the emergence of uh, waste parks that make the link between a waste stream and the, the uh, input material for uh, industry. Um, we, we are just the year before uh, India takes the presidency of the G20. So I think we, we also have a, a massive opportunity here to uh, work in the context of the, the B20, the, the, the business um, spin-off of the G20 and, and really foster this idea that uh, getting to common measurement of circularity and environmental performance uh, is, is beneficial to the private sector, be it only because it gives a sense of direction, a sense of progress and predictability in the value of the investments that can be made in this direction. So I, I, I look forward to uh, engaging further uh, with the Indian private sector because uh, you will be the local players, uh, the local team, uh, but I, I hope we can foster conversation with the rest of the world. And in particular, to see whether those uh, industrial partnership between EU and India I was mentioning, they can be expanded in a trilateral fashion so that those more uh, affordable uh, sustainability solutions, this frugal innovation I was mentioning, they can not only be produced and sold in India, but also exported uh, in other parts of the world that would need it, so that um, India is true to its uh, global hub uh, vision. Uh, with that, I would like to, uh, to conclude. Um, as I said, I'm not uh, far from it an expert in, in circular economy, so I'm just here to learn. But I was very grateful to uh, uh, get the chance to speak to you on behalf of EU. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Buki, for that. I'd like to invite Rachna Arora now to please talk about the EU states mapping study. Rachna is an old friend of CII. She works as a team leader in the resource efficiency project of GIZ, whose German translation I will not attempt. Uh, she's also team leader on the GIZ Circular Economy Solutions Project to prevent marine litter financed by the German Ministry of Environment, Nature Conservation. She's been working with GIZ for the last 13 years, doing lots of bilateral projects with the European Commission, and has supported the Government of India on policy formulation and its implementation. She has a doctoral degree in environmental chemistry from IIT Roorkee, and has been part of interdepartmental committees set up by Niti Aayog. She has worked with the Government on the resource efficiency strategy, and is on the Research and Development Committee set up by the MEIT, Ministry on Waste Management. Welcome, Rachna.
चेक हो जाएगा हां खुल गया यही से बात है thank you uh, thanks nandini and uh, thanks michael for setting the context of what you has been doing and uh, of this session as well uh, yeah i think you've already got my introduction i would like to uh, mention few of the elements uh, as nandini mentioned we have been friends of cii this entire project eu resource efficiency initiative uh, is actually a very very dynamic a very engaging consortium where cii is also one of the members jiz is the lead of this entire project and of course we have uh, terry and uh, adelphi as our partners so i think that's there plus uh, the direction that we get from the eu i think that's how we have been kind of running into the second phase of this project and also happy to hear uh, michael announcing that there would be a third phase of this project too um as the project uh, the title also defines uh, we are uh, a project who is trying to delve deeper into the entire issues of resource efficiency circular economy and this entire engagement starting uh, way back in 2016 where in uh, like in terms of the dialogues but of course we got it commissioned in 17 the entire discussion at that point in the indian government was largely around uh, resource efficiency and of course circular economy as a term wasn't that uh, uh, used into the government uh, setups but if now and nandini announced 11 committees if you actually pick up any of the government policy starting from february this year onwards they have three legislations which the ministry of environment specifically brought out largely epr led but they all focus not only just end of life but also talk about the relevance of upstream changes and how eco design circular economy is a key context to even these policies which are coming in and of course these 11 committees the momentum that niti ayog brought on by getting these uh, ministries to take action is really something which is uh, driving a lot of uh, transition process and from the eu side with the circular economy action plan there are lessons there are experiences and of course the last two years of covid has also given a lot of at least uh, understanding on both sides that that we need resilience we need partnerships which can actually be nurtured and you can actually have a better stronger engagement so some of the elements we'll try and uh, kind of uh, talk about uh, to be begin with uh, just to set the context of uh, uh, in 2017 to 2020 there was a lot of discussion uh, baseline studies assessment sectoral focus which we have been doing with niti ayog and ministry of environment as our key counterparts but then of course there was a stronger realization on both sides the indian as well as the european side to actually have a stronger alignment a partnership and uh, this is uh, one of the historic uh, kind of uh, agreements a joint declaration uh, michael also and mentioned about it resource efficiency and circular economy which was signed in july 2020 by the heads of the states uh, on both sides and i think this has actually set the context of how we actually are dwell uh, going deeper into this entire engagement in the phase of the project that we are currently implementing Uh, a lot of it actually nudges towards bilateral policy dialogues and i think this is what different member states and uh, we'll kind of present some of it the eu member states active in india of course have from the eu side the circular economy action plan plus their actions that they do in their own countries but when it comes to india a lot of action is happening so it's also action happening bilaterally with the government uh, there as well but how do you actually strengthen this is the entire cooperation with this uh, joint declaration knowledge exchange information uh, exchange so that you can actually synergize rather than creating different uh, kind of uh, silos into this implementation financial instruments is key i'll just give one of the examples again we have a company a startup here uh, from kerala even if you now just look at how single use plastic has been picked up by the government of india there is a lot of momentum they have realized that of course alternatives is something that can push a change but then with one when it comes to the financial instruments they are now looking at options which also includes international plus the indian kind of measures of how you can actually strengthen these startups and take it to a larger position which is where i think eu is also developing a lot of financial instruments so how do you actually look at a parity across whether it's standards whether it's kind of research innovation uh, alliances and with sig work one of the companies also here on the panel we have been trying to at least look at the research innovation aspects as well 
and at the EU side, of course, uh, research has been one of the key areas as well. Uh, so this is how the, the main key elements of the joint declaration. We as a project, the EU resource efficiency project also has major components, the three key results of a project, which is assessments in the sectors of priority, both from the Indian and the, uh, the Indian government, as well as from the European side. We kind of delve deeper into those issues and then figure out where are the interventions possible on circular economy uh, issues. And uh, I think uh, Michael has spent two and a half, three years in India, and uh, he's more uh, now a person who talks about repair as an economy rather than us kind of promoting it. So I think this brings a lot of kind of relevance of uh, kind of understanding on both sides that there is an entire skill uh, framework that we can talk about, especially on the circular economy, which can be more just as well as more inclusive when it comes to looking at these priorities as well. Uh, Something which was touched upon, and I think India is heading towards the G20 presidency. Uh, in the context of circular economy, there is a resource efficiency dialogue, the RED, as it is called. In 2017, G uh, Germany kind of just uh, launched this uh, in um, where Indian government was also present. And that actually provided a platform for exchange of best practices and uh, kind of building up these partnerships further. So this kind of was a big transition to put circular economy on an international agenda with the G7 and G20 countries prioritizing this at an international level. Similarly, in 2019, again, a bit kind of a declaration which was historic was the marine litter, the uh, specific emphasis towards the plastics, the realization of plastics as an important area where blue um, uh, ocean vision and other kind of global innovation uh, movements were prioritized. Um, in 2020, during the Italian presidency, the resource efficiency dialogue, of course, gained a lot of traction. And just a few months back, even in the Indonesian uh, presidency, this has been very uh, proactively taken up, especially in terms of what kind of knowledge networks, frameworks could actually be taken uh, forward, especially with regard to the priorities that each of these countries is identifying. And uh, for India, of course, this is going to be a big uh, uh, discussion as well as a preparation that is going along. Plus, uh, CII uh, uh, as well as uh, we as a project are engaging into these different kind of discussions to prioritize areas which could range from plastics to uh, end of uh, life vehicles to uh, food waste and other priorities that the government is, would like to identify. Uh, again, on the BRICS, level also resource efficiency circular economy uh, during the exchange in August 2021 when India was a presidency. This has been identified, especially again identifying uh, the need of uh, creating an entire knowledge network and uh, uh, policy dialogues, especially uh, in certain areas where you look at uh, instruments which can actually gear towards an industrial uh, symbiosis or other mechanisms. Uh, this was of mutual interest and the sectors which were of a priority on both on uh, the in the BRICS countries have been identified as well. Uh, coming to the Indian presidency, which would begin from this year till November 2023, uh, the priorities are in discussion with the Ministry of Environment and there are a lot of kind of um, areas. But uh, a pretty evident fact is that circular economy is going to be one of the key areas into the environment uh, dialogue uh, or the environment um, committees, and which is also looking at strengthening uh, the resource efficiency dialogue and exchange of solutions, uh, plus the innovations that are happening across the different sectors and value chains. Uh, coming to the uh, EU member states mapping study, this, as I mentioned, for our project in this phase, it was really, really key to figure out what are the actions and uh, kind of uh, issues that uh, the EU member states in India are addressing because uh, it, it is kind of a, a wide topic. And when it comes to each and every sector, every member state brings it their own kind of capacities, their own initiatives, their own set of innovations. So that's why we wanted to just figure it out, capture different project and initiatives that are going along and then see where exactly we can support the implementation. Because largely, our project in this phase was gearing towards doing uh, pilot implementations on the ground, supporting the state governments in terms of implementing what measures they can take. So that is how this was quite uh, uh, yeah, a priority for us to figure out. Uh, we've actually had uh, primary uh, data collection done, and uh, Anshul 
a colleague of ours who's present here has actually spent a lot of time kind of discussing with the EU member states, trying to capture the data, which is both primary surveys as well as secondary uh, literature that we have looked into, because uh, the entire aspect is that you actually do can do a lot of desktop research, but when you go approach and also look through what are interventions happening on each of these sectors uh, across, and especially at the state level, we wanted to just kind of bring that entire uh, knowledge together into this uh, one uh, report. So I think uh, every member state, of course, brings a lot of uh, their own ideas, their own set of um, uh, knowledge. But largely, the measures that they focus around is policy dialogue, strengthening the dialogue in discussions, largely with regard to exchange on standards. And if you just look at standards, of course, you can't have a standard which is just uh, a German or certified through DIN or something specifically coming out of other member states. There is harmonization which has happened at the EU level. There is harmonization even Indian government with BIS tries to do. So that is why we wanted to at least bring out this very clearly because when we were also going into sectors like construction, automobiles and others, uh, each other company uh, representative is actually looking at harmonization of these standards, especially from the export uh, areas as well. And then how do you actually bring uh, eco design and other aspects, which is pretty evident in the European side, but also kind of start to discussions with the policy, with the BIS, and also kind of mainstream it into the business partnerships that we were trying to do. Uh, then for us, the sectors of interest have been both from the EU Circular Economy Action Plan, plus also the 11 committees that Niti Aayog uh, kind of set up in India, which ranges from plastics and packaging, steel and aluminum. Uh, in aluminum, for instance, the red mud is like the bauxite residue which is remaining. And here we also organized a lot of site visits with the EU experts, with the three leading producers of aluminum in India and the dialogues and discussions. So this is with the Ministry of Mines and uh, the uh, mem the uh, state of like hung Hungary was pretty kind of uh, uh, like available to share the experiences with the disaster that they had there. So it's not always just of a very successful example, but how do you actually even address an issue which has been like such a uh, kind of a journey and experience? And how did you move ahead with that part, uh, kind of area? Was something that was brought forward even into these dialogues with the EU member states for a case specific example of red mud? textiles and agriculture. So there, there's, as I mentioned, a lot of it coming out of the EU as well as the Indian uh, priorities. Uh, one of the policy instruments is, of course, EPR, which is pretty evident now into the Indian, um, as I said, from February onwards, they've included it in plastics. It is part of tires. It is in batteries, which was just notified a uh, few uh, weeks ago. So this, of course, brings a lot of innovation potential which is where I think the industry plus the EU member states and those experiences can be counted by the Indian side also uh, clearly. So uh, just again summarizing what are the potential areas of collaboration as we see, and of course this is not the exhaustive list, but still looking at strategies, regulations, and standards and eco-labeling. This has also been identified by the Indian side as an area of exchange. Eco-design and repair. Um, on repair, Michael already mentioned, we have learnings on both sides to be exchanged because, of course, uh, uh, there are different ways of how we count on repair. And there are certain examples of also when we are doing repair cafes in our project in certain cities. Waste management logistics, of course, this is a big priority for the uh, for uh, India as well. Sustainable manufacturing for MSME, low carbon, and as I mentioned, uh, automobile sector, the automobile component manufacturing industry is looking at uh, exchange uh, there as well. And then other areas are, of course, uh, mentioned here as well. Uh, coming to uh, some of these, and as I said, this is not exhaustive. This is just one, um, because just to keep the time also in uh, this, we have just kind of referred to one of the main uh, MOU or cooperation that the few of the member states are having in India, specifically related to RENC. So uh, Finland and India, uh, for instance, has a, have a cooperation on environment, which is largely focusing largely on air, water pollution, waste management, uh, promotion of circular economy, and low carbon solutions as well. Uh, similarly, coming to Netherlands, it also has a MOU with the state, which is the state of Maharashtra, uh, on sustainable uh, manufacturing, circular economy, waste management, and cleanup of rivers. And we, of course, had something during the last uh, week on the in International Coastal Cleanup Day as well. Uh, in 2020, uh, 20, Denmark and India, 
have an MOU on green technologies and uh, geographical indications. San, uh, one of the representative here from the EU company would also share uh, her experiences, but of course this is also coming uh, from Denmark or I think maybe Netherlands. Yeah, sorry. Uh, then Slovenia and India in 2019 had a technical cooperation on standardization specifically, and this also kind of focus areas is on resource efficiency, uh, which is internationally accepted uh, standards. Uh, 2013, like way back, Spain and India actually have, uh, in terms of research and innovation, a long driven uh, engagement. And the fund uh, on innovation is actually looking at research and technology development, but also looking at clean tech, uh, IoT, uh, digitalization, and sustainable development largely. Uh, Sweden and India, uh, Michael already mentioned one of this, but uh, still uh, on sustainable urban development also there's a long uh, kind of a process and engagement that they have around sustainable urban planning, integrated solid waste management and sustainable transport, uh, uh, water and sanitation management. Uh, again, uh, the Indo-Nordic project, uh, which comprises of Denmark, Sweden, fin Finland, Iceland, and Norway. Uh, this is actually a showcase on Nordic research-based innovations, and uh, they have a joint research collaboration between the uh, cities of Pune and Bangalore. Uh, Germany, of course, uh, uh, is pretty active also on the space on circular economy, um, uh, initiatives and GIZ has been one of the key implementing agencies uh, on behalf of the German government. Uh, one of the initiatives mentioned here is the Marine Litter Project, which we are implementing together with the Ministry of Environment and also with Ministry of Housing, uh, which is the city part of uh, the Marine Litter Prevention, uh, largely looking at EPR and innovative solutions and work with the state governments in key areas of interest. Uh, similarly, on textile, uh, the German government has DPP, which is a development partnership funds to support the not just the German companies, but also the and also some of the Indian companies have got the DPP funding as well to implement projects on behalf of the uh, German ministry, which is a BMZ. And uh, this example is just of the textile project, just to say that we are kind of active in different areas as well, looking at textile to textile recycling. Uh, similarly, Netherlands has a bioma uh, biomass India setup, which is looking at uh, setting up a, a biomass upcycling center on utilization of agricultural residue, the example that you will just uh, hear. Ragbag is also a Netherlands company looking at fashionable bags and all. Similarly, French company Veolia is um, uh, pretty active across the many states. One example is with the Delhi gel boat in terms of reusing and utilizing the wastewater. Uh, Sweden uh, also started with a pilot project in 2019 from the National Agricultural Bio uh, Food Biotechnology Institute. So just trying to see the entire domain of projects that are happening and which is also on the similar topics like air pollution and utilization of the resources, the bio residue into uh, a product. Uh, Finnish company River Recycle and VTT is actually implementing a project in Mumbai on cleanup of plastic litter. Similarly, Hungary and India already mentioned about their active engagement on uh, applied research and development and also utilizing a lot of these um, pulverization or value added products into the tire industry, which is now one of the policies that Indian government has also brought out in this year. Uh, just the last slide on potential areas. Of course, there's a lot of collaboration opportunities which are possible. We are also trying to figure out areas where we can do just one example, and of course, these partnerships range not just with the EU member states, they also look at or EU companies, also look at a closer partnership between Indian companies and the uh, European companies as well. So uh, we are pretty active in two states, Goa as well as Rajasthan, and of course, from the national level as well. But still in these two states, uh, we have a buy-in, we are working with the state government to implement a resource efficiency strategy, which we released in 2020. Now, the topics here range from tourism to marine litter to plastics to innovation and solution, setting up like a lot of these startups uh, also, and circularity in industrial areas has been a kind of a key request from the state government. And here, uh, EU member states are also active. So we would, of course, like to pitch again that if there is an interest and uh, we would be happy to kind of connect with the uh, EU member states, also with the Indian companies and the European companies to take 
a lot of these uh, kind of things forward. Uh, the other thing is that in this phase of the project, we, as a demonstration um, kind of a measure, we actually are uh, setting up a circular economy innovation lab. Uh, this is something where we are right now in the discussions, uh, developing the concept and also looking at kind of pooling resources because um, there are different forms and ways of how this innovation lab could be set up. It can range from, and there is, of course, uh, many of these living lab examples that are existing across the EU member states. So we would like to kind of look at a pool of innovation, uh, different member states could showcase, Indian companies could showcase their innovation as well. And then we can look at this can also be a network, this can be a lab in existence. So we are still kind of figuring this out, but this is going to be one of our key areas of work in this year uh, as well. Uh, then uh, something very uh, kind of innovative we are doing is with the state uh, of Rajasthan. And uh, this is the eco uh, park or the waste recycling park, which we are doing on request of the state government. Uh, here we are actually doing a site master planning, setting up the entire um, kind of support for the state government to set up this lab, which will be the first of uh, set up this um, kind of park, first of its kind in India, but also trying to cater to all these uh, waste streams, whether it's solar panels, whether it's e-waste, plastics, uh, even some form of hazardous waste, if it is uh, possible, and uh, also looking at uh, end-of-life vehicles. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's the entire uh, kind of um, idea. Both EU and some Indian companies have expressed their interest to the state government in terms of setting up uh, their units in this recycling uh, facility, and we are right now doing a kind of a, yeah, a baseline, a pre-feasibility, and of course, a site master planning for the state uh, there. So yeah, these are three potential areas, but there are many more as we shared and uh, yeah, we'll be happy to connect further with that. Thank you. Thank you, Rachna. Thank you so much for that. I think something that emerges quite powerfully from this presentation is the fact that the term circular economy, which often gets, uh, is understood synonymously with recycling. You tend to hear of examples of people saying that, oh, this, we've already got a circular economy in practice, we're already recycling. But I think what this demonstrates is that circular economy is way, way more than recycling. And one of the very important principles uh, embedded in the circular economy are business models. Uh, and that brings me nicely to the topic of the second part of this session. The speakers we have over here are not just distinguished people, but they are people who are very tightly bound to on-ground work in the area of circular economy, whether they call it circular economy or not. They are part of new business models. They are part of using what, what we might call waste, but it's no longer trendy to call waste waste, but it's also not sensible to call it waste because the connotations are all negative. So uh, you will hear from these speakers one by one about a little bit about the work that they are doing. I will request them to introduce their work briefly and uh, then I'd like to ask them some questions about it. We have one participant on online. Is she still there? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, may I request you to hold on, please? The lady is out of India right now. Uh, or, or is she in India? Uh, she's outside. So I think it would be, let's allow her to speak if that's okay with you. So the lady is waiting. She's waiting to speak. Uh, she's outside the country. So, yeah, I, if, if that's okay with you, just, yeah, okay. So, uh, the, the, the video we are about to show you right now is about Ecor's work in South India using agricultural residue to make panels for construction. And uh, San Carrier is the founder and director of the Material Innovation Center. She dreams the future into being and anticipa anticipates a world in which nature and technology merge. Sun builds inspiring, purposeful businesses. 
working towards the systemic change via responsible production and consumption. She aligns her business concepts and principles of the circular economy. She facilitates disruptive technology startups, governmental bodies, public organizations, and multinational companies to co-develop materials innovation and large-scale commercial success through her growth strategy, which she calls ecosystem development. Her circular business models have proven to outcompete the traditional linear approach. So may I request you to play the video and then we'll ask San a couple of questions. Andhra Pradesh has both three regions, and the coastal region is predominantly the paddy, whereas the other region, Rallasima region, is mostly with the dry crop, but then Paddy is also grown over there. Mm -hmm. So that way, Andhra Pradesh is mostly paddy oriented. Of late, what is happening is with the intervention, in a, intervention of harvesters, the straw is cut, almost about six inches is left over. That one of, uh, straw is the stock is left there in the field itself. And in 2019, uh, we started an extensive research on uh, on ground in Andhra Pradesh, and uh, where we were looking on how biomass is used currently here, and how much percentage of biomass is getting burnt, and uh, uh, also on the supply chain, how it would work. <laughs> And the gun and Chippy, the Indian mission, but the chapter. Let the cultures. And the gun, the west to Kuga Shalom to Molana, Kara, then Tolgitsa, Tolgitsa, Potis, and Marakai So, uh, during our feasibility study in uh, 1920, what we understand is almost 70 percent of the paddy straw has been burned. The uh, philosophy of ECAR would be that um, we take something that is currently considered as um, of less value of, or that would be waste, and we turn that into something that has value. The ECA technology was developed in order to have a application for abundance waste streams and raw material streams of cellulose, where with only water pressure and heat, you can make a panel. A panel can be applied everywhere. The technology as such is low-tech, low but it is highly disruptive because we eliminate the concept of waste of cellulose. With these materials, we create beautiful material uh, panels that can then be used for furniture production, for interior design, for packaging, and that can be remain in use for as long as possible. Our approach was to link it to communities. Uh, set up a collaboration model between the community organizations, farmer producer companies, and use the technology which has been tried and tested by ECOR uh, globally, but it also has the potential to set up material value chains in India. So we don't want to build a massive facility where, then, uh, like in a traditional linear manner, we want to have small upcycling facilities enabling and empowering to make a material difference for the people 
which are working there. And at the same time, we will bring customers from an international perspective who then also provide for the economic foundation. So there is prosperity for everything and everyone involved. Now, uh, in this case, which is a bioresidue, the pricing is not an issue. The recognition of this material as a potential uh, stream is very, very important. And uh, what we're... Foundation, so there is prosperity for everything and everyone involved. Now, uh, in this case, which is a bioresidue, the pricing is not an issue. The recognition of this material as a potential uh, stream is very, very important. And uh, what we're trying to, of course, establish is through behavioral change, through a lot of series of awareness uh, uh, dialogues, using a set of people who could actually bring out this change is, I think, going to bring a lot of change into the thinking the process. I think Fabra would be very willing. The only thing is that we'll have to make him understand what is happening around with the Fabra straw and what is going to be done and how it is going to be useful and how it is going to really bring in more sense or more source of income for him. The link between mm -hmm. ECOR mm -hmm. and the column is um, remarkable. Mm -hmm. So the effect mm -hmm. that it would have is that we can create a field of positive mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. that will actually is made by the material that we are working with. And actually a lot of us are looking at India and, and the, like the, the, the traditional uh, wisdom of India on many aspects, uh, on, on how you take care of your body, on how you, uh, you are mindful of your diet, uh, on, on and how you have an interaction with nature. So we would be honoured if the technology could also find a way uh, into the India society and economy, such as the column also has had and has. Wonderful example. Online. Hi, son. Are you able to hear us? Yes, I can. I can. Are you able to hear us? I, I can. I think there was a small delay on the line, but it should be okay now. Okay, if there's a slight delay, that, that's okay. I think we can manage. We can put the questions to you. Thank you so much. That was a lovely film, very simple and conveying the message really nicely. So um, I see that you're a practitioner who's doing this in India, but you're based in Europe, at least you were. Uh, you wanted to tackle the problem of agricultural waste residue and wanted to do something that would end up being useful to society and the community. What lessons did you learn about the importance of partnerships in this? Since that's what this session is about, what can we learn from you about the importance of partnerships? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's not easy to um, link me in, loop me in. Um, I'm working from project location in Indonesia at the moment. Um, so I'm very grateful that we can make this work. And I'm also very happy to see those project partners that are so important to the success of the, the project all um, gathered there. So I'm, I'm very happy to see you all. And I think that maybe from the, the video as well, it becomes clear that if you take away these project partners or the partnerships, all that is left is the technology. And a technology in itself will not save the world or find a way forward for humankind. So. What I have learned is that during the early years of my career, people didn't even understand, like, what is your job then? How, what are you doing? And I said, I, maybe I don't even know exactly, but what is needed is to be able to form a partnership on different levels so that that technology is embedded in a social uh, structure, in a local culture, um, within the business model as well. And if we don't do that, then we will never be able to reach uh, scale. So for me, the, the, the role of the partnership as a way to grow and scale such technologies, it's es essential to, to get circular economy to a global um, stage. 
Yeah, I also see the point that you're making about um, once you embed this in the community, the chance of it working and staying, uh, of, of, the, of the model being sustainable are far greater. The chances are far, far greater. So um, I'm wondering about how there are so many examples of this coming up in India, and thank God for that. We have some examples of speakers here itself who are at this table who are engaged in, uh, in the kind of activities that you are. But uh, if you were to extrapolate this, how, how much do you think this is possible? Uh, how, is it possible for this kind of use to spread throughout the world? Or do you feel this is restricted to areas, uh, you know, maybe in India or South Asia or, or Africa, where people are much closer to agriculture? Do you see a future in which we are exporting construction panels made of biomass? So that's a really good question. And I am indeed very glad to see that this is popping up all over the world. So it's not just um, in one location and then maybe another remote location. It seems like there is something happening now in our collective consciousness that makes us pick up this, this approach to, to economies. What I use as a framework for the success of a circular economy is most of the time um, an action radius of, let's say, 300 kilometers. Because if you, for the sourcing of the material, but then also for the selling of the material, if you go broader than that, then the logistics and the impact of the logistics, so both in cost, but also in um, ecological impact, they increase to such a degree that you can actually set, better set up another hub uh, so outside of that 300 kilometers. So what I see happening, whether it be in an agricultural uh, context where we can use the agricultural residual streams or in an urban context where we can use uh, recycled textiles, for instance, as, a, as an effluent uh, residual stream, with that 300 kilometer radius, we can actually scale. So to have many, many, many of these micro economies and thereby reach um, um, a global shift in how we drive our economies. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Staying local is um, at a life cycle level far more sustainable. Hmm. Thank you so much, San. Uh, if I think we, we can move ahead to the other speakers now. Um, I'd like to move to Mr. Manu Sharma, if I may. Yep. Manu Sharma is the Chief Product Officer of Structure, S-T-R-A-W, and brings with him more than 25 years of experience in working with different technologies. He's now looking at acoustic product development using sustainable materials. He comes from the school of thought that circularity and natural sources of raw materials are the key to enhancing performance of buildings and structures. He's worked with organizations such as Nikon and Bose in the past and is a firm believer of the interdisciplinary approach. He has an MTech degree in microwave electronics from the University of Delhi and he's worked extensively abroad in Canada, the UK, Europe, Australia on materials and acoustics. Welcome, Mr. Sharma. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question for you about some of the products that you make. In fact, maybe you could please just introduce some of the current work that you are doing, uh, which involves the use of raw materials that one would normally consider waste, or that's not conventionally used. Well, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough that uh, my turn to speak has been in line with what San just mentioned. So uh, the attempt that we are making here in India is not too different from what San does globally. Uh, it's in fact quite similar. Uh, we work on agricultural as well as animal residue to, to try and utilize the fiber, the power of the fiber that comes from agricultural residue and animal residue and make construction material out of it. From the primary level of uh, construction material derived, we further try and intervene with it at an engineering level so that the utility could further be enhanced for multitude of applications, you know, not just it being a panel that goes to make a drywall, but, you know, value added by bringing in, as I said, engineering and intervention, primarily by introducing, uh, you know, minor changes in geometry and uh, fiber placement, and uh, try and make it more adaptive uh, more result-oriented, more useful, and extend the landscape of usability 
for let's say acoustics for ther uh, thermal insulation as well as for uh, you know storage spaces where traditionally the challenge that was faced in storage spaces was uh, to have some kind of an you know uh, control of ambient environment to try and ensure that uh, you know there is no fungus no no decomposing material there so uh, there is so much uh, power in the basic fiber that we use which comes from you know the so called untapped resource of uh, straw fiber not many of us know that uh, straw uh, the fiber of straw has a unique property of fire retardancy because it has uh, silica as a content in the natural fiber and silica by virtue of its chemical property uh, is fire retardant in itself so for us to place it in a construction environment and enable it as a fire retardant material you know we don't have to really do uh, we really don't have to do anything extra it comes to it naturally so we create that product which is a fire retardant product you could use it to make you know as they say dry walls or isolation walls by bringing in little bit of value addition we make it more receptive for certain acoustic functions likewise for insulation as well so such is the power that goes into that material which conventionally i must say was very well regarded in vernacular architecture it had its you know visibility it had it had its utility but for some reason it got lost into oblivion but here we are, we are trying to make a sincere attempt to bring it to realization again, where we try and place it against the contemporaries of modern day world. And we have been successful in taking the message out to the larger audience and, uh, you know, uh, making them realize the benefits of what the good old te technology was all about, which somehow we lost in, you know, transition of time. But it's about time that we bring it back to the fore and reap the benefits because one, it gives you the performance that you need. And then, yes, it secures the environment that we live in. Thank you. So that addresses part of this, the other question I wanted to ask you about the properties of the material that you make. Uh, what kinds of tests do you perform on them? Or what do you do to ensure that they are fit for purpose? That's number one. And uh, number two, I mean, one would assume that since your products are made of raw material that is a biomass residue or agricultural residue or animal hair, as you mentioned to me earlier as we were talking, I'm wondering whether you build in an end of life approach also to this. Is it even necessary? Well, absolutely. You know, being a part of this ecosystem, um, usability, reusability and, you know, reusability after reusability is something that we try and look into. Uh, the first part of the question about the durability of the product, I can say it with confidence and I mean, I, we were never short of confidence on this, but to validate our confidence and belief in the product, we got it tested by, you know, the designate labs who certify the standards of uh, products to be used in build environment. And I'm uh, very happy to share with all of you that we have cleared all the required benchmarks for it to be enabled and used as a product for regular construction uh, industry. Uh, the second part of the question, which talks about the life cycle of the product, as I said, uh, you know, there is a reuse after the use, and then you could reuse it thereafter as well. So our product, after completing its first life cycle of placement and usage, can be, you know, uh, brought back to life again at a factory level. And uh, just to add a small little bit to it, that we are working on certain other uh, value added features whereby instead of using you know standard bonding material we are working on bio residues uh, which will form the adhesives and will make this product as 100% biodegradable hopefully which would be the first of its kind globally we are very close to it we have done the trials and hopefully let's say in about 6 or 8 months from now it will be out in the open for everybody to uh, it, uh, you know use it that's excellent. Thank you so much for this. It gives a good opening to go to our next speaker, or next entrepreneur rather, who is Mr. Vinay Balakrishnan. He's a postgraduate in geology with 25 years of experience and over in sales and administration, operations, etc. His last assignment was as CEO for a life insurance company based in Mauritius, but he resigned that job and came back to in India to India to find an alternative solution for the massive air pollution during stubble burning. So uh, India is a land where there's lots and lots of agricultural waste, 
which is wasted year on year. And uh, he's worked on finding alternatives, eco-friendly and affordable products made from agri-waste. He was showing us a little while ago a plate that you can eat after eating in it. Um, I didn't ask you about the calorific value, but never mind. Um, this has resulted in the births of the brand that they call Tushan, which is a biodegradable alternative to single-use plastic using wheat bran or rice bran. Vinay, tell us something about your product, please. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thanks to CIA and EU for giving this opportunity. First of all, uh, as uh, Nandini said, we are using wheat bran or rice bran which is currently wasted. Some of it is wasted, partly it is going as cattle feed. So how we use it is roughly, for example, for a one kilogram wheat is milled, roughly 20 percentage goes as bran. So this bran, some part is being used as cattle feed, but majority is either burned or thrown into sea or a lake. So what we've done is we have taken this waste rice bran or a wheat bran and what we have done is we have converted it into tableware which is made from wheat bran first and basically what we have done is we have made plates which is since it is made from edible wheat bran after finishing your meal if you want you can taste your plate also that is the concept so it's a single use product so after use I'm not asking everybody to eat the plate, but at least you can give it as cattle feed. You can give it to your hen or cock or something. It's a poultry feed. You can throw it to any lake. It's a fish feed. Or you throw it in a tree, near a tree and put some water. It's an organic manure. It's a 100% biodegradable product and it totally biodegrades in less than 30 days. So this is a product which we have developed in connection with the premier research laboratory in India, CSIR. It's a government of India laboratory. So it has taken us four years to make one plate. It's a very, very difficult technology and we are not wasting any single ml of water or any product is wasted. 100% is converted into plates. Right now our plant is in Kochi in Kerala. And uh, we are really proud to say that we are the only second in the world to have this technology. And uh, this we are manufacturing in a fully automatic robotic plant in Kerala. And uh, in addition to that, we have also developed another product, which is made from broken rice, which is actually our edible straw. So you can safely drink your drinks and eat your straw also. So this straw is an alternative to usually available plastic straw or a paper straw, which gets soggy after 10 or five minutes. So our straws, which can be utilized for almost one hour in any normal liquid or a cold drinks. So the plates, the biggest advantage is it is microwavable. It can withstand temperature from minus 10 to 140 degrees temperature and it can hold liquid content up to one hour. This is one of the major advantages. Now we are going ahead to manufacture our cutlery ranges also shortly. So it will be our fork, knife, spoon, takeaway containers, as well as cups is coming on the way. Thank you. Oh, okay. So two questions for you. One was in the past as you developed this, what was the largest, most significant, most troublesome technical challenge you faced? And going ahead, what is the most significant challenge you expect to face? The most difficult part was the technology. Because as I said earlier, there was only one company in the world which was doing it earlier, which was not in India, but outside. So when we tried to develop this technology, I was not knowing, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a businessman. Out of passion, we started this. So when we started a design, the premier research institute CSIR was in touch with us. We funded the project from our own money. 
it took almost one and a half years of hard research to make one plate by CSIR. So I was very, very particular that we should not use any water for wastage or any harm to the environment. So no plastic, nothing to be done. So this was the most technical difficulty what we faced. Because any product, when we use mix with water, there is going to be a water wastage. So I am proud to say that we are not wasting even a one drop of water in this technology. That's why it took us four years to develop this technology. So this is one of the technological challenges we had. Somehow we have overcome that. Now coming to the second part, which of course, what we are facing is the scalability issue. We have the plant, we have the machinery, we have the technology, we have the process. Now, our products has to reach the entire globe. Actually, this is a global product. It's not only for India. This is for the entire world. So if a scalability can be done, this product can be sold at the same rate as plastic or any other product which will be affordable to the common man. And this will ultimately result in reducing the single-use plastic or a paper or any kind of reusable or a single-use product available in the market. So I am definitely looking for that day where it can be scaled up so that it will reach the entire mass. And a similar product, if available anywhere in the world also, I think we can look at customizing to produce it locally at any country in the world. This is what we plan to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I believe you also have some samples of your products. So maybe after this session, we can take a look at those. Yeah, yeah. I have brought some samples just to show everybody. It's yeah. available here. I can show it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have not tied up. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Budde is our next speaker. He is the founder and chief managing director of BioCare India, which manufactures biotechnology based inputs to organic agriculture. He has a master's in environmental sciences and a doctorate degree also in environmental sciences. Is that right? From the University of Nagpur. Please tell us a little bit about your work, Dr. Budde. Uh, thank you, Nandini, and thank you, CIA, to have me here. Uh, so as a student of environmental science, uh, the waste material always fascinated me, and particularly from the region where we come from. Uh, it's a majorly uh, power-generating area of Maharashtra. And uh, one of the major uh, pollutants from the uh, thermal power station is a uh, fly ash. And I always felt that... Uh, the fly ash has immense potential to be used in agriculture. And that's how we started our quest for utilizing fly ash into agriculture through a lot of uh, experiments through vermicomposting, composting. But to see that uh, through composting, we cannot mix more than 20% of fly ash into the composting. Uh, then we started thinking that why not use uh, fly ash as in soil conditioner? Because traditionally in agriculture, liming, gypsum are used uh, uh, for soil conditioning, which uh, ultimately generated a lot of CO2 and greenhouse gases. And we, we felt that uh, if we are able to use fly ash as a soil conditioner, uh, because there are a lot of properties in, in the fly ash which can really act as a soil conditioner because it reduces the bulk density, it changes the physical structure of the soil, and thus changes the microbial uh, activity in the soil. So that's how we started building up uh, a, a a soil conditioner based on fly ash. Uh, now we add a lot of biostimulant uh, to it uh, to enhance the uh, root growth and other activities of uh, the, this product is available uh, in the market in the name brand name of BioSeal. Since last 15 years, we have been using this product. And we roughly uh, consume 50,000 tons of uh, fly ash as in soil conditioner every year. This is well uh, accepted product in central India now. And fortunately, uh, with a lot of persuasions uh, with the uh, National Standard for Organic Produce, uh, this has go also got a certification as in product to be used for organic uh, agriculture. So, uh, so this is our uh, uh, 
story of our product development so far. Uh, 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 we had done the extensive study of this material at ICR laboratories, and we could find out that 25 to 30 percent of the yield parameter growth are there uh, by using this uh, particular product alone uh, with the conventional uh, fertilization doses. So it makes a fantastic study uh, um, case uh, for an west uh, to be upcycled as in soil conditioner where it is also giving more growth to the agriculture side. So, so that's our uh, basic work. So a question I have for you here is uh, again two-faced. One is about the scaling up of this. What is the current capacity that you have and you know, how do you expect that to change over the years? And the second is from my understanding of the composition of fly ash, uh, how do you deal with things like the heavy metals and uh, some of the those components in this? You have yeah. certifications, of course. Yeah, right? no, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the question is right. So if you really look at the uh, uh, complete analysis of fly ash, the, uh, the micronutrients which are present or the heavy metals which are present there in the fly ash are actually used as a product in agriculture as in micronutrient. Uh, so, so it really helps, uh, and we did an extensive study that the toxic elements of uh, or this micro uh, of this uh, heavy metals are not really taken up by plant uh, to that extent. So that study has also been done that uh, no no uptake of this uh, heavy metal from the fly ash when you put into soil is in the plant. So that study is also available. I see. And so it remains immobilized in the soil. Is, yes. is that what happens? Yes. Oh, oh okay. Oh well. Uh, please, could we please, uh, I request you sincerely to allow us to complete the round and then we'll open up to the audience. Please do ask us your question then. Um, the second question, of course, is about your biggest challenge. Tell us what it was. So uh, when we developed this as a product, uh, it was very difficult to convince the regulators that this product can be used as in soil conditioner. And that challenge remains even today. Uh, but somehow we could get some certification around it, some analysis from the department that uh, this can be utilized as a uh, soil conditioners. Uh, so that was one of the major challenges to to convince the regulator, and definitely scaling up, uh, convincing the farmer to use this as a material uh, against the gypsum and the other soil conditioner is also a challenge. But uh, since since the farmers have started using it and they started getting good results. Uh, that challenge is now reduced to a great extent. So yours seems to be a fairly well-established product right now. Yes. You have yeah. done that. Oh, that's really good. We'll move now to our last panelist, um, who is Mr. Ram Krishnan Karanth. And he comes from a background which is quite different from that of the other speakers, but it's no less in terms of the potential of the area that he's involved in. Um, I'll introduce him. He's done his Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Mysore and started his, his career as a commissioned officer with the Indian Air Force. He currently holds the position of CEO of India Region with Zigwork Inks, the global leader in the field of packaging inks. His experience profile covers P&L management, sales and business management, business revival and turnaround. There is a whole lot of them, so I'll just read a few. Sourcing and supply chain management systems and standardization, HR and R functions, and there are plenty more. So he's clearly an expert. But um, I think it would be good if you could tell us precisely what it is about your product that fits into this discussion today. Uh, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Nandini and CIA for giving me this opportunity mm -hmm. to be on this platform here. Uh, I come from this uh, inks field. When we talk of inks and plastics, you know, I come in this notorious set of people who go and spoil the environment. While we miss out on the fact that because of this packaging material, we prevent the spoilage of food, and we ensure that food and your daily needs are reaching out to every one of the homes in safe condition. Hence, you know, like while I take pride in the fact that I'm a plastic engineer, but at the same time, we are also well aware of our uh, responsibility towards Mother Nature, and to, en and to ensure that basically uh, the circularity is actually well maintained. Circular economy is, you know, like it's a 
relatively a recent phenomenon, though packaging had been there for quite a few years, you know, quite a few decades, or in fact, centuries, I would say. In the circular economy, if you really look at, it becomes very necessary that as a one aspect of circular economy, we need to ensure that the products are basically biosourced. That helps in ensuring that the circular economy is practiced in uh, the true spirit. Otherwise, as Madam mentioned earlier, just simply saying that I recycle the material, hence I am uh, circularity compliant, I think it's not really a very right approach we can really take up. So what we do in Zigwork, in fact, Zigwork is a company with about 200 years of standing, and Zigwork had been consistently working in the forefront to ensure that our products that we put in the, out in the market are safe for the environment as well as for the user. You know, it's not only for the environment, but finally the packaged material that comes to your houses and to my house, that should be completely safe for consumption of the every person who's consuming it. Now, biosource material, when we look at, in fact, you know, like in the inks and inks mainly, if you look at the pigments, dyes, etc., there is a whole stuff of inorganic material out there. And we will keep wondering how do we go for biosourcing? That's where we come in. We've got a technology team which works relentlessly on promoting biosources in this kind of uh, usage. To give you a, a sort of uh, you know, information, in the recently concluded uh, uh, sustainability awards in Europe on the September 13th of this month, just about you know, like a few days ago, uh, one of our products known, known as UniNature, it won the coveted award for most sustainable innovation. This UniNature product by itself, this ink, has got a, uh, has got a sort of, uh, you know, the biosource material, bio content, bio renewable content of more than 50% in it. You know, whereas the contemporary other solutions, uh, it has got about 7 to 8%, whereas this particular material has got 50% biosource material, bio renewable material in it. This is one of it. You know, while doing this, Always we think that when you go for a solution like this, invariably the performance drops. Whereas here in this particular case, we have established that the performance of this material is significantly superior to the contemporary material, other material in the market, one thing. Second thing is the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, which are generated by this material is absolutely, in fact, it's well in control. And it's much superior to the rest of the material, which are equivalent material, which are used in the market. This is one aspect. Similarly, uh, in, in various other ink systems, even we use biosourced material right up to, in fact, you know, like renewable material, right up to about uh, 40, 50, 70 percent. Recently, in India itself, we took a call that we will move out of uh, mineral oil-based uh, inks. You know, in the offset inks, when you when you look at conventional inks. You, you use extensive quantity of mineral oil as one of the component. Now, mineral oil comes from basically non-sustainable source. It's a fossilized uh, material. Whereas we replaced it completely with vegetable oils. With vegetable oil usage, this uh, conventional offset ink, the bio-source material or bio-renewable content, it goes up right up to 70% from the standard of around 20 to 30% otherwise. So these are the kind of efforts which we are continuously, in fact, working on. Apart from this one, there are things like, you know, like bioethanol for uh, solvent-based inks. This is another aspect which we are working on. Now, like all this uh, stuff, what we are working, you know, only we working on it is one aspect which we continuously do. But I think it's very necessary to educate the uh, sort of uh, society as well as the consumers and the industry. That's where we work very closely with the brand owners. We work very closely with packaging companies. We go and tell them actually what are the developments we are doing and how we can really help them in their quest to become a circular economy company and how we can really support them to ensure that the biosource material are maximized, bio-renewable bio content is maximized in ink. But on the other hand, if you look at, the inks are actually a very small portion of the total packaging content. Very, very small portion. Hence, that's where we work out that not only we work on the ink, but we help our customers and brand owners to become circular in nature, like circular economy, how they can really get in. On this aspect, the couple of things that we are doing is one is going for mono material instead of laminates. Laminates, it's very difficult to recycle. When you go for mono material, recycling becomes much easier. That's first thing. 
The second thing, paperization. You know, if you look at the standard uh, soap wrappers, they, they used to come in a composite of polyester and paper or BOPP and paper. That's where we have worked with a couple of multinationals, one brand owner and one converter. With them, to convert this one into a mono material with paper, with a suitable ink coating and a pro protective coating on the inner side. So hence, with this one, the paper itself is much easily sort of, you know, like, uh, you know, you can put it into the circular economy compared with the plastic. So these are all the various aspects which we work on. Uh, long way to go still. Plastics, if you really look at, uh, be it not only in India, in any of the countries, the kind of plastic waste that ends up in the marine uh, life and with the water bodies, it's very, very huge. That's where we need to really get into the circularity in the right way. The next step, what we are developing currently is on de-inking. If you do the de-inking, then the circularity really becomes much more better. You know, today we don't find actually plastic bottles here, but the plastic bottle wrapper, which is on the top of it, if you put it into the recycling, the color actually spoils the output of the recycled granules. If you get, get into a recycling, then like what, uh, you know, like in European countries and certain countries, even the recycled plastics, there is a, cl a clearance for using it, reusing it in the uh, plastic bottles. Whereas in India also the ambitious targets are already set in that we should really go for this kind of circularity. This is a field we are working on, but long way to go. Resource efficiency also, there is a quite a few things what we can really do on. And we are working closely with the converters as well as brand owners in this direction. Thank you. There's a question I wanted to ask you, particularly uh, as part of the India Plastics Pact, we come into touch with a lot of recyclers who mention that uh, the inks and dyes that, as you also alluded to, uh, during the recycling process, leak out into the or dissolve in the water and discolor the, the, the final granules. Uh, you did mention that you all are dealing with this kind of thing, but um, is there any plan to to completely to tackle this to a degree like 100% so that it never causes a problem? Yeah, that's what I was coming to. When we say the de-inking concept, you know, this in the de-inking concept, uh, what happens is basically you've got actually a, a sort of, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of technology involved with that one. With this one, what you're doing is you are able to remove the ink completely from the printed surface, be it on a label, be it on a carton, or be it on a surface printed mono material plastic wrappers. You can de-ink it completely. After the de-inking, in fact, it's in a sort of a closed kind of loop. You do the de-inking process. At the end of the de-inking process, you are able to take out the complete colored portion out. Hence, you are left with the original plastic granules or plastic material which can be put into the re recycling completely. On the other side, for the recycling even, when you look at, it's very necessary that you eliminate the chlorides. If you don't eliminate the chlorides once again in the recycling process, it can be harmful for the people who are doing the recycling as well as for environment. This is the second aspect what we are working on. We have already got a solution which we are actually sort of working with the kind of a couple of pilot studies right now, whereby we are eliminating the chlorides completely from the ink. So this kind of stuff, when we do it, color as well as chloride, and maybe any anyway, heavy metals, we, have, we do not really use at all as of now. So with this kind of stuff, in fact, we are able to say that the products, whatever we put out in the market, even at the end of the life cycle, they remain safe. Because finally, the inks, whatever is removed from this one, obviously, it gets into, you know, like a kind of a, you, a very small quantity of sludge, which gets into a kind of compacting and disposal eventually. But the majority, you know, tons and tons, millions of tons of material, which is actually ending up as pollutant right now, we can really work to uh, minimize and eliminate this one to a very great extent. Thank you very much. I think we're, uh, thank you so much to all the panelists for your uh, very, very engaging descriptions of the work that you do. Um, I think there were questions from the audience, so maybe we could spend a little time on those. Yes, please go ahead. If there's a mic, could someone kindly pass it on to him? Oh, well. I have uh, actually uh, more than one question. Uh, I'll begin with Madam uh, Rasna. Uh, you have uh, talked about technologies 
which are basically waste uh, utilization. For example, your uh, red mud or something. And this has been the convention in our uh, industrial waste management that we try to talk about uh, utilization of slag, we try to talk about utilization of fly ash and all that stuff. But uh, I, I think that is not what we understand by circular economy. In my view, the circular economy will start from the uh, process itself. What's your take on this? I mean, have we come forward with technologies which are really producing uh, minimal waste? Sure. Uh, is that the one question? Yeah, yeah. Is, okay. Yeah. So, no, I think uh, you have four of the companies sitting here. And of course, their products and the waste or the resource that no, they're utilizing is generally, ranging I mean, across. Of course, uh, uh, in, in their case, it is some kind of waste utilization. Exactly. For example, we talk about steel steel making, we talk of aluminum making, or hundreds of other uh, right. larger industries. I'm talking about that. Uh, sure. So, uh, the I, economy will make exactly. the technology. That is what right I was... beginning process. I have, of course, not gone into the definition of what circular economy means for India as well as in the EU. But uh, some of the examples, and they range from across the different sectors. We have not touched all of them. But I completely agree to your point, and I think just one uh, quick kind of reflection. Uh, if you look at steel or if you look, look at aluminum, there are strategies which the Indian government and those sectoral ministries have put forward on their action plans. They are not only just on utilizing waste, but they are also driving across the sector of uh, areas that they can do uh, scientific uh, research and also kind of bringing out elements which are not just end of pipe. Also, in terms of utilizing a lot of this so end of life vehicles and that entire uh, kind of a process is there as one of the action plans which is included in the Ministry of Steel as well as Ministry of Mines. So, there is a lot of it to be done, but of course, uh, end of life is not the only solution. It's a long way. And we have four of these examples which are here as well, which I, I think clearly bring it out. I'll come to Dr. Budde. I just wanted to know because conventionally, People believe that uh, the fly ash coming out from the thermal power plants, even that is going out of the chimneys, is going to harm the agriculture. That has been the convention. It is, it, it is a now, difficult. what is it in the fly ash that you consider good? So, uh, your I, statement I is right. A few, few. No, your statement is right. Once this fly ash is put in the air, uh, it is it is not of use to agriculture because uh, in the flower when it the fly ash sets in into the flower flowering stage it uh, hampers the poll pollution uh, pollination and uh, it disturbs the whole uh, fruit cycle. So I am talking about giving this particular soil conditioner in the soil itself. Anything uh, any material as a fly ash which is coming on the plant will uh, not only affect the uh, uh, flowering and fruiting stage. I or also the uh, making it too long yeah. what will it do to ph of the soil so it uh, or it, can you yeah. use it for alkaline soil yes better so, uh, or so, acidic soil it is better or normal soil it uh, is better so for uh, acidic soil it is better because uh, uh, if you are able to process uh, take a flash from a particular process of a electrostatic uh, precipitator then it enhances the cation exchange uh, capacity of the soil and this uh, enhances the efficiency of the materials or the fertilizer in the soil itself. So I can take you uh, take that uh, offline also if you want I, to understand. I want to uh, dominate the time, but uh, right. still, uh, uh, I had So if you want to really go deeply into it, that, uh, are you are you it is uh, uh, taking a particular size thing? or you could I just to... give give one. Sure. So silicon which, last question. silicon which are you is... are you taking a particular size or just? No, we are taking is... a particular size. Yeah, and uh, the silicon which is present in the uh, fly ash is actually binding with the aluminium. And the aluminum toxicity of the soil is also reduced in the red soil, particularly. So I can take you offline on okay, this. Sir, yeah. I, we'll I move on now. Problem. Yes, um, please, you. Uh, is there technology? Uh, technology. Could you please uh, 
indicate who you would you are addressing your question uh, my question is general anybody okay. could uh, okay. is there technology available to convert the agriculture waste to uh, fuel uh, biofuel or green hydrogen uh, let me address this question in a more fundamental way uh, every problem has a solution and every question has an answer it's just a question of how efficient is the process of translating that question to an answer so for the moment uh, to answer your question is there a technology available yes however uh, the process part which uh, brings in efficiency element of bringing out uh, the content that you want to out of agricultural waste is still being deliberated it's still being worked upon the derivatives at present day process are not really affordable hence uh, it's work in progress yeah uh, so i have a question i am sanjay khare and i basically work for auto industry from skoda uh in europe particularly there is a lot of focus right now for automotive materials which should become bio based we are going in a big way moving from plastics to recycled plastics uh, uh particularly they have used coffee beans for dyeing the seeds and all so is there some development happening in that direction because it's got a lot of potential it's a very big industry if we can give rugged products at least for the interiors that would be a very useful thing so question to you nandini or to any one of you Uh, yeah no definitely there's a lot of innovation on that space happening and uh, even when we are working with acma which is the automobile component manufacturing industry they also see changes happening at least uh, there is a demand and uh, that is how they translate it to their tier 1 tier 2 uh, suppliers as well uh, many a times this demand is also to be driven by the oems like how um, the and that ways i think uh, so it's kind of a uh, it just depends of how huge is this potential how can you drive the entire industry plus also especially addressing the pi uh, point of standards uh, what kind of materials are available how much of that is standardized and uh, how how can companies take it up so we have played some of that role at least making those uh, information available creating an access to those companies uh, at least the indian companies with the tie up to europe european companies but I think if, if there is some if there is some specific link or somewhere available, I can connect to my global te team on this topic because okay. they are very aggressively working on these topics. Sure. Yes, please. And then after that, the lady at the back. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi. This is Piyush Sharma from uh, Mani Karan Power. I am a part of strategy team. So the question is to Mr. Suhas. Uh, your product. Uh, Uh, compared to bio manure uh, it is compared to bio manure which is coming out from the biogas plants or the cbg plants it is better or it is equivalent so uh, there is certain aspect uh, of soil conditioning which is done by the fly ash and there is certain aspect uh, of the conditioning which has been done by the manure side but uh, our experience is that once you give this uh, particular fly ash based uh, uh, soil conditioner it is able to do the microbial activity also around it so maybe a combination of this will work fantastic uh, but that is what we have done in a trial also uh, but uh, these are two different things uh, whereas manuring is a very conventional thing uh, using fly ash as in soil conditioner is itself is in uh, new concept uh, and it reduces a lot of pollution related issue in the thermal power st uh, station vicinity yes please Uh, hi, I'm Vidhi from Mumbai. Uh, just uh, speaking with respect to uh, circularity in plastics, uh, the sector of upcycling plastic to different materials is coming up in a big way. Like you know, there are a lot of startups working wherein, like you know, the, they they claim that uh, different kind of plastics can be upcycled to products like garments and furniture and etc. but we do have a concern with the uh, with respect to microplastic and nanoplastic generation when it comes to these plastics being divided into granules and then converted into like you know combined with some other material and being made into garments and all that so do we have any framework on the policy level or like you know with the innovation and everything where we can keep a check on like you know this 
thing not getting like you know scaled up in a big way because of course like you know there are two things of course we have the microplastic and nanoplastic issue and on the other side consumers believe that okay they are like you know uh, contributing in a good way that they are going to give the plastic that they use to someone who's recycling and upcycling it and that kind of becomes a placebo to use more plastic by the consumers so do we have anything in place where we could tackle this issue I'll address your question, if I may. <laughs> um, there are some there are some possibilities, and there are ways to think about what you've just suggested. Um, I agree with your points that uh, all kinds of down or upcycling need to be carefully examined. There are caveats with each kind of activity. But may I request that we meet you after this session, since we are focusing on partnerships and innovation? Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who has? Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm Mangesh Gupte from uh, Action Alliance for Recycling Beverage Cartons, particularly the paper-based beverage cartons across India for food and beverage industry. This question is for SegWork, although this is a bit of technical question related to the innovation. Uh, first thing is congratulations for your Packaging Europe Sustainability Award. Uh, the uh, de-inking process which you mentioned, the polycer, I think, polycirc or something of that kind you have named it is it applicable for the inks of the uninature kind or they are applicable for the currently prevailing fossil based inks applicability for the what what is the, i couldn't hear the you inking complete. process which you yeah, mentioned de-inking yeah uh, is it applicable for the uninature kind of uh, specially developed inks by you or it is applicable for the prevailing inks in the market mm -hmm. no it uh, you know basically if you look at uh, prevailing in inks in the market uh, our own prevailing ink, it will work. Okay, Q, why? In fact, you know, like basically, when you look at the re, uh, de inking process, you have got actually a sort of, you know, you have got a, a release kind of layer on which the ink will have to be printed. Now, the chemistry between the two becomes critical. That chemistry, if we don't really address, then the de inking may not work at all. Hence, basically, if you look at whether you can use any ink out in the market, with this process, unfortunately, as of now, it won't be possible. Eventually, maybe, in fact, but you know, it's a still on the developmental process right now. We are on the pilot stage as of now, and eventually, maybe, but as of today, no. We can take maybe one question more, and then we must wind up. Oh, there isn't one question more. All right. Rajna, may I request you to please uh, sort of summarize the day's proceedings, the session's proceedings. Thanks. Thanks, Nandini, for uh, managing everything well in time and, of course, giving everyone uh, yeah, an equal opportunity. Uh, I would, I think, since the session uh, topic was partnership and innovation, the uh, examples or the uh, at least the discussion that we have had, some of the elements are uh, all across the value chain when we talk about and just imagine like uh, some of the elements that have been mentioned, I, I, I'll just like to reiterate. So technology, you know, when it comes to circular economy or any transition in that process, we all think, okay, technology would work. But uh, one of the elements, of course, that even uh, uh, San mentioned that for them, technology is not a real challenge. For them, it was an issue to actually see how partnerships, how can you actually come down to a level of a community showcase, this is where there is a pro possibility and this is what could be done with the product or with the end or five product as well. So I think partnerships, of course, are key. It ranges from across the actors and all the other uh, speakers have also clearly reflected out that how they, during their entire work and engagement, have been trying to kind of build on these further as well. Uh, then one other element is that, of course, things are not that easy when it comes to circular economy. And of course, the aspects of creating that ecosystem is also quite multidimensional. And so, for instance, the um, question that you had towards the end with the beverage industry, no? or even with the example that you mentioned with SIGWORK, uh, for any consumer or for any government, it's very easy to ban a product. But when you really have to think about a scale, and I think all the companies present here are actually talking about what are the issues that they have gone through where technology was one of it, but the other point was how do you actually set up something which is at that scale that can bring a transition and even starting on the material uh, specific, the innovations that have gone into 
starting with this entire de-inking process or even with yours on straw, uh, straw culture at what, uh, yeah, even with structure, structure as well. Uh, it, is, it is, I think, quite a challenge, uh, especially to think of what goes into developing these products and how much of the innovation is actually required. And it's just not ending. You mentioned about you're even going on thinking of these products to be biodegradable. Now, so I think that's where it is just not ending. There's no boundary to it. But of course, you also look at products which have to be standardized, certified. And that's where I see the entire cooperation coming back to the EU uh, mapping study or the relevance that we were trying to show that there is a bigger dimension even within the government, whether EU or India. We're also looking at an entire, say, air quality is an issue. And I think at least the three examples present here are actually shown how their technologies, how they work on the ground, can actually bring a bit of a change to control, or at least, uh, uh, yeah, make a transformation to that uh, waste which is right now being burned into a transformative uh, way. So I think there's a lot, lo lot of it to go, and I kind of consider the point that you mentioned that it's not going to be the end of life route. There is a lot of elements required, especially to kind of consider these changes, which is design change. For every, every product, every uh, kind of a sector, the issues are very, very um, large and they need to be addressed in a way which addresses both policy as well as implementation and also still considers things which are uh, implementable, scalable on the ground as well. So yeah, I think thanks to all the panelists here. Uh, it was really interesting, at least for us, to uh, take some of the messages uh, and see how we can uh, still as a project try uh, to support uh, some of these solutions to scale up and build up further partnerships as well. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rashna. I'll give it to Michael for the final word. Okay, th thank you very much. And uh, I'll try and be brief. The, the, I feel a bit shy to take the floor again uh, after uh, real experts and, and real practitioners uh, have, have uh, shown very illustrative experience. Um, but uh, from my like policy making uh, or policy dialogue perspective, uh, the, the point I would like to make is that uh, you can see that the lack of innovation is empering partnership or the lack of uh, established partnership is empering co-innovation uh, between companies in India, in Europe or between Europe and India. I think what, what this session illustrates is that the, the partnership is uh, by and through and for innovation. I think that that's really when we try and address uh, problems on both sides and when we try to adapt uh, one solution to a different context that the good ideas uh, crop up. The second point I wanted to do is, is that um, the, the circular economy does not equate uh, a plastic-free economy or a bio-based economy. I think in the case of those wonderful uh, plates that, that are biodegradable and that you can even eat, uh, they, are, they are still to be distributed and stored and packaged in plastic at the moment. Um, and I think it, it's, that's a fact that there are certain convenience in the, in the plastic economy uh, that, that have not fully yet translated in those products and, and we still need both. And I think that's a good illustration. That's also a good illustration that um, it's not only about uh, producing a bio-based product, it's about distributing it and, and that causing in question for me the the notion of just buying a product you are buying a product but you're buying a product at a given place at a given time and so that uh, suggests that there is a link with the distribution and production system so the the, the point that was made by uh, uh, the, the lady connected online uh, san i think san yes uh, that uh, the ideal uh, model would be a distributed production i think is very telling um, we, we, we cannot rely on centralized uh, production uh, as we used to. Uh, actually, if you look at the geopolitical map, we are all rethinking uh, our supply chains and trying to limit our dependencies on, uh, on resources, on imports, on fertilizers, on energy, uh, even on water. So the, the, the notion of uh, self-sufficiency uh, as well as connecting through uh, selected, deliberate uh, global supply chains where we have a common understanding of environmental performance, I think is, is also quite telling. Um, you, you can produce for the local consumption and you can at the same time develop a product that, that has uh, a future and a merit and a commercial potential elsewhere in the world. 
So th those this glocal, it's a new uh, funny name that we hear a lot these days. I think that that really lies there. Um, yes, I think that that were, that were my my main points. Thank you very much again, uh, Nandini, for the the good sharing and timekeeping. Thank you so much. Thanks again to all our participants. Thank you very much for sharing your innovations and your knowledge with us today. Thank you, Rachna, so much. And thank you, Michael, very much. Thank you, audience, for your questions and your time. Thank you, everyone. May I request all the speakers to gather for a group photograph?